uh, several activities have been undertaken. This, work, this best practice forum has been organized by the ITU, International Telecommunication Union, and uh, in, uh, let's say, in collaboration with some of the partners that we have put together uh, in relation to one of the initiatives that are within the, uh, the cyber security related activities of the ITU, which is called Child Honor Protection. We are going to hear a little bit more on this and all the other initiatives that are related to this very, very important issue. So uh, since we are late, I just, um, we just start, and uh, I would like to introduce you Malcolm Johnson, which is the director of the Standard Decision Bureau of the ITU, which will provide, let's say, the openings on this, on this forum. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, welcome to this uh, first workshop. I think the, the workshops uh, during this IGF uh, expect to be uh, extremely useful um, to uh, put forward uh, um, some views on, on best practices that could be, could be followed um, by the various uh, players involved here. And so we're quite pleased to be able to uh, present to you some of the activities of the ITU in relation to um, child online protection. Of course, the um, spread of the internet and, and ICTs generally brings enormous uh, economic benefits and uh, educational benefits, especially to young people um, who, of course, taken to the internet uh, like fish to water. Um, but of course, uh, we all are aware of uh, the dangers uh, that uh, they are exposed to on, on the internet. And uh, we have to take uh, coordinated measures to try and protect uh, children from, from these uh, harmful, harmful uh, situations that uh, they can be exposed to on the, on the internet. According to recent surveys, over 60% of uh, children and teenagers talk in chat rooms on a daily basis. And uh, three in four children online are, are willing to share personal information about themselves and about their families in exchange for um, goods or, or services. And one in five children uh, will be targeted uh, by a predator or, or a pedophile. And of course, uh, uh, there are sites uh, promoting uh, child pornography and violent games, illegal content, um, which uh, they can be exposed to. There's a few uh, coordinated campaigns to address this issue, uh, and uh, it's important to develop an integrated and coordinated global approach in order to be uh, effective in addressing the problem of child online safety. In the World Summit on Information Society called uh, to strengthen action to protect children from online abuse and also called uh, on the ITU to build uh, confidence and security in the use of ICTs. In accordance uh, with this mandate, the ITU created the Global Cybersecurity Agenda and uh, within this, the framework of this agenda um, we're committed to uh, connecting the world both uh, safely and uh, responsibly. Consequently, uh, we consider that child uh, protection issues are, are, are a top priority. In June uh, this year, ITU uh, adopted um, a new standard for uh, an international harmonized child helpline number, 116111. And um, data from the Child Helpline International shows that uh, children and youngsters made, make more than 10 million calls a year to uh, child helplines. So having a, a single global number will help to, um, to uh, make this uh, more widely known, this number more widely known uh, in, in embedded in the, uh, the consciousness of, uh, of uh, children uh, worldwide. And in, in the last few weeks, ITU launched uh, its Child Online Protection Initiative, COP, or, or COP, uh, which is strongly endorsed by 
our uh, 191 uh, member governments. And the, the key objective of this initiative is to uh, identify the, the, the risks and vulnerabilities of children online, to create awareness of these risks, uh, to develop practical tools to help uh, governments, organizations, law enforcement agencies, and uh, educational institutions to, to minimize those, those risks, and to uh, share uh, knowledge and experience while uh, facilitating international partnerships to define and implement uh, concrete uh, initiatives to overcome these, these risks. So um, it's a new initiative and uh, we look forward to coordinating uh, efforts in this uh, um, initiative to protect children online by collaborating with, uh, with governments, with, with industry, um, educators, law enforcement uh, and child experts. ITU's uh, membership is, is global, as I said, 191 uh, governments and uh, over 700 private sector entities um, make up our membership. It's a very long history of uh, facilitating standardization and, and expertise in ICTs and uh, in development work. Um, so um, we believe it's a good focal point to uh, coordinate uh, partners on a worldwide basis. It's going to be a, a difficult task, obviously, um, for various uh, reasons, not least the fact that um, there are many different uh, cultural viewpoints um, to be taken into consideration. And uh, so it's important that we, uh, we push ahead and, uh, and share our concerns and to develop necessary, necessary measures to ensure that uh, the world's children can benefit uh, safely from uh, this uh, marvelous uh, technology that's now available. And so we hope that um, discussions that uh, we can have with uh, key stakeholders during the IGF will help uh, to to develop, uh, make awareness of this initiative and to, to develop uh, how we're going to take it forward. So be interested in, in listening to the discussion and participating in it uh, this morning. Thank you, Malcolm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. So uh, we will three then to the, let's say, the, the three sessions that we have uh, a little bit identified and according to the aspect that we want to analyze. So there will be the initial one that is related to the, let's say, to the dangers that uh, generally speaking to frame a little bit the debate. Then we're going through uh, a little bit the possible threats, I mean specifically and with the help of the private sector as well, Microsoft, to identify uh, what, what are uh, what are the, 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 the threats. And then we are trying to, we will try to wrap up a little bit, uh, provide providing also uh, possible instruments, specifically legal instruments, that could be necessary to address uh, the, the, these issues. Uh, I know that the timing is a little bit tight, but uh, we'll try to, to manage, so I go, <laughs> I go immediately to the, first, uh, to the first speaker, which is Dieter. And uh, let me get, yes, Dieter Kartensen, which is for Save, so from Save the Children. And uh, he's basically the chairman of the European NGO Alliance of um, Child Safety Online in Axel. Thank you. An invitation to speak to you today. I just want briefly to pick up on, on what was just mentioned by uh, Malcolm Johnson in regards to three quarters of young people wanting to give out their private information. Um, a very funny sort of incident a couple of weeks ago when I spoke to younger people about exactly this uh, issue of dealing with um, privacy and them handing out their information rather freely. So the information that you hand out uh, in order to access goods and services is somewhat the currency of today, but we don't really know the price of that currency. So when I tried to have a discussion with them, they just told me I'm old school. I don't understand because that's the way they do it. So literally, we are facing dangers or at least challenges that we are not out of. We can't control them; they control them themselves. And I think that shift in paradigm is just impossible to sort of predict as we stand uh, right now. But nevertheless, 
we have to do what we can. And um, today I'm going to give you three brief examples of what we have done in uh, in a European context, and hopefully there will be some inspiration for you um, to bring them forward. As mentioned by Marco, I coordinate Safer Internet uh, and Child Online Protection Activities for Save the Children in Denmark, uh, which is also part of the Save the Children Europe group that deals with child sexual exploitation of children. Furthermore, do I chair the coordination committee of uh, INAXA, which is the European NGO Alliance for Child Safety Online. Save the Children Europe, uh, which have signed up to the ITU's Child Online Protection uh, Initiative, and congratulations on this initiative, which we very much welcome and look forward to collaborate with you on. Um, Save the Children is part of uh, the Global Alliance, and Save the Children is uh, the largest independent child rights organization in the world. Currently 27 members with 130 plus activities in countries, or 130 plus countries. Um, our work is based on the United Nations Convention of the Right of the Child. Um, we have been working on combating child sexual exploitation and child online protection since 1998, possibly a bit earlier than that. Currently we deal with awareness campaigns, research into children's use of interactive technology, hotline against uh, child sexual abuse of material, um, and training and facilitation and lobby on these issues. Corporations, of course, multi-stakeholder, that's the only way we see uh, ourselves to be able to have an impact. Uh, many of our activities, they are funded or co-funded by the European Commission's Safer Internet Action Plan. It was an essential part of European way of dealing with this problem uh, as we stand today. We also participate in several European uh, Commission or United Nations expert groups on online child protection, online child safety and combating child sexual exploitation. Since September this year, We've been lucky to receive funding to uh, create a pan-European NGO alliance on child online safety. The mission, as you can see here, is basically to develop and support actions uh, throughout Europe and, about, uh, and beyond to protect children in relation to new technologies. So basically what we have to do is create an NGO base that's sufficiently strong and capable to carry the message and develop good practice in the countries where they operate, um, agree on common approaches that we are considering to be good practice, to finally go and influence the relevant policies and politics and developments in the countries and international institutions that we have uh, as our targets. Currently, we have 13 countries in Europe, members of the Naxo network, plus uh, internet luminary John Carr, who is also speaking to you a bit later. Um, we aim at reaching 20 members in the first two years of operation, and then finally, hopefully, including uh, all EU member states within the next four years. Just to set the scene, responsibility, when we talk about responsibility, we mean that everybody has a role up to play and everybody has a responsibility to protect children from any kinds of abuse, especially sexual abuse. So regardless of whether this happens offline or online, it doesn't really matter. Everybody has a role to play. Everybody needs to take their load of the work. Today we often find in discussions with the different stakeholders that they still distinguish offline and online environments and there really is no or there should be no distinction between them. Um, it's part of everybody's lives, especially young children as will be seen in many of the presentations over the next couple of days. There is no distinction, it's just a continuum. We, myself, elder people would see the difference because we woke up or we, at least we grew up without uh, connectivity and so forth, but that's not the case for the younger people today. We also believe in interagency cooperation as the concept and, uh, and the concept of working together is key for our successes, if we are likely to succeed, which of course we believe we are. So it happens on whatever level, international, national, or with the local government. With all the other parties that are listed here, they're all basically having something to say and they have impact on uh, children's protection when they're online. 
In Denmark, we run a hotline which is co-funded by the European <coughs> Commission. We have a hotline receiving referrals on transsexual exploitation material online. It's co-funded by the EC, as I mentioned. We collaborate directly and specifically with the police in Denmark and the electronic service providers, so mobile network operators and uh, ISPs. Member of INHOPE, which is the International Association of Hotlines since 2002. Just to give you some figures, um, out of all the reports that we received in 2007, close to 30% were categorized as illegal. And that's one third. The other two thirds were not illegal according to Danish law, so there could be anything. It could even be uh, harmful content, uh, but still not illegal. Out of these 29%, a third of them, they were new to us, unique, and that basically counts down to 15 unique websites per week, not seen before, not registered before. If you take, and this is just from a country of 5.5 million people, so put it in context in larger countries, you might see this escalate. I don't say that you can multiply a country by, if it's 200 million people, then you can multiply it by 40 and you would have the same quantity, but I just mean, a third of them knew it's quite a lot. What we do with these uh, referrals, we trace them to the apparent hosting country and the apparent hosting countries uh, on the top three were the US, Russia and Japan. And they, these three amounted to more than 80% of uh, the total figure. One Please, sure. No. Thank you for the questions. It's good. When I mean illegal sites, we mean what is illegal according to the Danish law. So we only operate within the Danish jurisdiction, viewing it with Danish eyes. So something that could be illegal in Denmark might be legal in other countries, um, and vice versa. So no, this was transsexual abusive images with real children, no images, uh, no virtual child pornography. That's not illegal in Denmark, so for that uh, reason, it would not be counted. No, if not, the number would have been extremely high. Um, as I mentioned, we have 5.5 million people. Um, in 2005, law enforcement, together with Save the Children Denmark and the largest ISPs in Denmark, they went together and, uh, based on UK experiences, which John will speak a bit about uh, later as well, uh, created a, a blocking initiative, blocking URLs at a DNS level. Um, currently, the, the database of the law enforcement, they basically collect information from the public, from us, from law enforcement uh, colleagues in Europe and beyond, um, vet them against the Danish legislation, sees what is illegal, what is legal, the things that are illegal. They document it and put it into a list this list is then circulated to electronic service providers who then block access for the general public. Currently there are 8,000 URLs in this database. In January 2008 uh, they had 2,700 unique attempts to access a site that was listed. That, that, is, a, that is per day, sorry, that is per day, yes, correct. So it's not meant to actually eradicate the problem is not meant to do anything but uh, actually hinder people from incidentally stumbling or coming across these sites. Please. Um, access logging. I know that quite a large proportion of um, access attempts are by search engines. Yeah. How many of those 2,700 attempts are search engines? As far as I've been informed by law enforcement, these are official figures that I put up on the website. They have, I believe, filtered everything away, also uh, search robots, crawlers and so forth, and I believe 27 hits, uh, 2,700 hits are unique URLs, uh, IP addresses going in there. Right, so that's unique IP addresses yeah. and they're um, um, to what? Well, this I don't know. This I don't know. It could be, you're right, I don't know. This, these are the figures I have. This just attempts to access, I did not mention it was human beings. It's attempts to access, unique attempts to access. I don't know who they are. Okay. But a valid question, nevertheless.
as I mentioned, national law enforcement in Denmark, as well as in Sweden, Norway, and other countries, they maintain a list of the legal URLs. ISPs, they receive the list. The end user writes the address of a site that happens to be on the list, and then the site is then blocked because it's illegal. What appears when they stumble or they come across the site, a stop sign or a page, stop page will appear, uh, giving the reason to the end user why the site has been blo blocked, and if they are disagreeing with it, uh, an email address they can um, use, enable to contact uh, the administration of this list to get it unblocked if they feel that this is uh, wrongly done. Sorry, I, sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, the review mechanism we just mentioned. If somebody think was it's very uh, it's very different from country to country. Um, some countries they do it on a 24/7 basis, so every day it's done one or two or three times. Other countries they do it. I don't know all the countries how they do it. I know here that um, they have a um, a mechanism to actually see whether this has been active within the last week or two weeks, and I think it's a weekly uh, review. But I wanted to know if my website is getting blocked. Yeah. I think this was not This is inappropriate. Do I have a possibility to have it reviewed? Yes. Yeah, ah, sorry. That's oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I understand. Yes, you have. There's a web. Uh, there's basically an address here where you are able to contact the law enforcement. Uh, to basically state that this site has been you know, uh, blocked for the wrong reasons or shouldn't be blocked and they will take it up and contact you, yeah, definitely. It has happened already uh, that contacts have been made. So that's the review. It is basically, um, I think this is what it serves. It serves to basically indicate the reason why you've been blocked and a review mechanism giving you the option to actually contact them. Does this answer your question? So this is one of the actions we do. Um, a step in the right direction is also that basically child online protection needs to be addressed from different angles um, because it touches different legislation, uh, different ministries that needs to be involved in this process to actually ensure online child protection. Hence the establishment of a cross-ministerial task force involving multi-sector multi multi stakeholders uh, is really something that needs to be done in order to get uh, an appropriate understanding of the issues, an appropriate platform for decision makers to sort of exchange um, their understanding of what needs to be done. Just in Denmark, to give you a brief overview of who is actually participating in this uh, cross-ministerial uh, cross task force. We have Ministry of Science and IT Communication, of course, but they regulate the internet um, and oversee laws uh, related di directly to its use uh, and deployment. Ministry of Education, because we also believe that awareness and education uh, of online safety issues are quintessential to actually safeguarding children while they are online. I think it's also essential to, s to mention that um, but nowadays you find a lot of countries, they are still not implementing any kind of school curricula concerned uh, with um, online safety. And, um, but they will quite happily give you traffic uh, rules and so forth when they're five or six or seven years old. Um, we think that they should also give them, the children, um, some pro appropriate education and tools and empowerment to be able to, to, be able to actually uh, have a positive experience when they're online. And the earlier, the better, actually. Finally, the Ministry of Justice, because a lot of it deals with criminal law on an international scale, um, you will still find countries that have loopholes in their legislation. So, um, for instance, the internet would not, would not be defined. And as such, a crime related to internet is not punishable under their laws. Um, and that's quite uh, amazing. But these loopholes are being used by uh, criminals for illicit purposes, of course, and um, until these loopholes are covered, uh, you will always have these um, activities located to certain countries. 
another issue uh, right now in Europe. There's a big issue regarding grooming of children for sexual exploitation, uh, and there's a need for harmonised legislation and understanding of the problem. So for the next many years, I think that's going to be one of the key tasks for us to work on that. Finally, um, another challenge is also the ability of law enforcement to exchange information across borders in order to sort of these are transnational crimes needing also a transnational re uh, response and if we are unable because of privacy and protection of, uh, of a person's uh, integrity and so forth are unable to share certain types of information just by moving a country that person can somewhat um, erase um, a police record or a, a, a penal record and start all over again doing exactly the same crimes to summarize, basically, uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration is key. It's mm, essential to create a mutual understanding of the, of the problem if we need to do appropriate, uh, create appropriate measures. International collaboration, equally very important. Um, and an appeal, many lessons have been learned, so rather than starting from scratch uh, and do the whole thing over again, we recommend that you speak to your colleagues. The same goes for ourselves in our uh, sector and learn from them and bring this one step for further and but do it in a fast way and finally everybody has a responsibility we need to act on it ITU's Child Online Protection Initiative gives us the platform to bridge the gap let's use it thank you very much I'm trying to really really I mean built on the effort that has been already done and uh, I mean the ITU is, is really trying to contribute in this direction and because there are very very I mean uh, good initiatives that are scattered around that are addressing national and regional let's say requirements but uh, there are really few that are trying to take it at a global level now obviously we had to adopt both of the both, both of the approaches you know the, the bottom up which is really trying to address um, I mean, local requirements and the top down that is trying to harmonize this and to try to find a kind of a global solution. I mean, uh, it may be difficult, but uh, I, I don't think that this is an impossible task to do. And uh, I think that in several environments and sectors, this is the direction that has to be taken. So uh, I now move to the next uh, speaker, which is Jan Martens, who is working for Child Helpline International. Child Helpline International. And, uh, Actually, CHI is working with the ITU since several years, specifically on uh, on the on a, on the number on a specific number, which is the one one six one one one. And I'm sure we'll hear more about this from him. Yes. Thank you. Which one? This one. This one. Uh, thank you, Marco. Um, first of all, thank you for the ITU for inviting us here. This is a case uh, of online grooming, and uh, as you can see, a girl called, uh, contacted the child helpline about an experience she had had online. Um, she wanted to talk about this and uh, what she should do, and this shows uh, clearly what, uh, immediately, what a child helpline can do to help children online. <clears throat> so the theme here is uh, child helplines help keep children safe online. Um, I would like to talk to you a little bit about what child helplines are to introduce them and second to introduce Child Helpline International, what, w what we do as an organization and then to close with protecting children online. Okay, a child helpline is a phone and outreach service for children and um, it is, it is easy to ac access, has a focus on child's rights, and links children to resources, and has different means of communication. The Convention on the Rights of the Child is essential to all work of all child helps, helplines worldwide. We target children uh, aged 0 to 18, as outlined in the Convention on the right of, Rights of the Child, and target especially those children that are marginalized, which means Children that are victim of abuse and violence, street children, children that live in dire poverty, etc., etc. So those children that are not in a position naturally to have and receive assistance and support 
child helplines have those children as their special focus group. Um, child helplines also use different means of communication to, you, uh, to reach children. Uh, we use phone, we use uh, online, com uh, online communication methods, but in many countries, in many situations, these communication methods are not yet or not suitable. So also face-to-face -face contacts, street buses, um, positions in hospitals or shelters are used to reach children in, in all situations. CHI and uh, ITU have been cooperating for several years now. Uh, child helplines were included in the WISIS uh, Tunis agenda in paragraph 92 and this, uh, this started the, uh, essentially a cooperation and since then we've been co cooperating on the allocation of short telephone numbers to child helplines er all around the world which are easy to access for children in all situations and are toll free so that all children can reach a child helpline. Specifically, last, as was mentioned, last May, June, uh, the ITU adopted a supplement on the allocation of the number 116111 to child helplines worldwide, following the, uh, the example set by the, in Europe by the European Union, which allocated the number 116111 to child helplines in the European area. Um, of course, we, we continue to strive for, for these short numbers for child helplines everywhere because it is it has been shown by our statistical analysis that numbers that are toll free and easy to remember for children uh, are much more, 10 times more, reached by children <laughs> worldwide. Uh, this is a graph or a chart of the membership of, of Child Helpline International. The red uh, countries are at this moment 97 in total full members of CHI. The orange ones are associate members. Child Helpline International was founded in 2003 in Amsterdam at the first official international consultation. We started at that point with 47 official members. Uh, at this moment we have about, well, to add up, um, 120 uh, associate and full members all around the world and we are active in around 160 countries. Uh, our continuing mission is to establish a child helpline all uh, in every country in the world and to have a good quality child helpline everywhere. What CSI does? What we do, as said, is the establishment of child helplines everywhere. This means that we attend brainstorming meet meetings about 10 a year in, uh, all, in all regions of the world to establish a new child helpline. We help uh, a, an NGO or a government agency with the establishment of a child helpline, making sure that the method that the child helpline uses is suitable for the context, culture, and uh, technological infrastructure of that country. We work with the child helplines that have been newly established and are established a long time already to improve their quality management. We provide trainings and manuals uh, peer exchanges um, and do a PSP checklist every year. Using this we try to improve the quality of the child helplines all around the world to make sure that children receive the best possible care in all situations. One of our main uh, goals every year as an organization is the collection and analysis of data of the context that the child helplines have with the children around the world. As said by Malcolm, uh, since 2003, every year, more than 10 million children have contacted a child helpline around the world. So that means that more than 50 million children have been able to reach the uh, support they need uh, since 2003. The reasons for contact with a child helpline are outlined here in the table on the right. Um, and the main categories at the top have been uh, have been quite constant over the years. They shift a little bit, but not that much. Um, this table outlines all means of contact, so that means telephone contacts, online contacts, and face-to-face -face and outreach contacts. Um, so all online uh, abuse and violence is uh, collated in the abuse and violence category. Together with the child helplines, we advocate at the international and regional level 
uh, and to get recognition for the work, that, important work that child helplines do, and to get recognition for the voices of children, to get them recognized as full citizens of this world and not just as mere as people that cannot think for themselves and do not know where their problems are. The contacts that the children have with the child helplines all around the world show that children know exactly what their problems are and they know how to express them and this should be recognized by decision and policy makers around the world and that is what we strive for. It is important that policy and decision makers recognize the voice of children and base their policies on the data that is collected by child helplines all around the world and use it to, to base their child protection strategies on. A little bit about internet usage growth. Um, probably you will see these kind of tables a lot over the next few days. Um, as you can see, the um, most connected regions are, of course, in the developed countries at this moment. But uh, very interesting, uh, interestingly, of course, the uh, highest growth percentages are reached in the developing countries. Uh, however, the absolute uh, numbers, that's to say the percentage of the population that already has access to uh, the internet is still quite low there in some regions. Uh, which means that in the future, first of all, the internet population will continue to grow and grow fast. And this includes children, and it needs to be, um, they need to be made aware of the risks they run online, and um, the internet needs to be safe for them to use. The internet is a great tool, a tool that can be used to, for learning, for gaining information. It has all kinds of purposes, but it, it is important that this is made safe for them. I just want to give a few best practices from around the world. Um, Nobody's Children Foundation, uh, one of which a representative is here in the room, um, is, a, is, a, is a node or awareness node in, um, in, in Poland. They work with, uh, um, they have a very active program to make children aware of the risks they run online and they have a very, uh, very good program for that. And they also have a hotline in which uh, children and adults can report uh, pictures uh, of online abuse and violence and to make sure that uh, all these pictures are taken down if necessary. The Kindertelefoon in the Netherlands is very active uh, in online chatting and they recently, about six months ago, l launched a program of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, counseling. That means children counseling children. Um, it's called Share in Trust, or shit.nl. It's become very popular amongst children because children feel they can more easily talk to their, uh, to their peers. And uh, at this moment, it's been reviewed how, uh, how it works. And hopefully, or maybe we, uh, it can be used in other countries too. Childline South Africa in South Africa um, has recently, or really recently, started an online uh, program counseling and uh, uh, awareness raising program. Kids Helpline Australia is using a text uh, online program and web counseling program to make children aware of the risks they run online and to make sure that children are reached in the method they feel most comfortable to use. Um, the context that uh, Kids Helpline Australia has shows that uh, the number of serious contacts of serious reasons, what we call serious reason, is almost triple the rate in other, uh, compared to other uh, means of contact. Um, these entail contacts about uh, depression, suicide, um, pregnancy, etc. Et um, children feel that they can use the online connection methods very easily. It is very close to how they think, how they feel, and they feel they can uh, can express their opinions more anonymously, uh, meaning that they feel more at ease to express what is, is bugging them. And in the Palestine areas, Sawa 121 uh, has recently launched uh, an email service uh, to reach children in the Palestine areas to make sure that all children in all situations uh, are able to reach the support and the help they need and to adapt to the very rapidly changing situation in the Palestine areas. 
These are just a few examples. Uh, CHI as a network is very actively engaging the online counseling and online protection uh, awareness programs. Um, at this moment, actually, in the Netherlands, a pro uh, training program is taking place on online counseling with uh, child helplines from the five regions. I um, can't remember their name exactly, but Aruba, I believe, and Mexico, South Africa, no, sorry, that's Namibia, and uh, also from the European and, so and Asia Pacific region to uh, helplines. And uh, also, we started several weeks ago a program uh, on new technologies for the European region, and the second part of which will be taking place in December and in uh, April next year. Child helplines, in first principle, are a reporting and protec protection mechanism for children. They help keep children safe online and offline. This means that children that have had a bad experience online can reach the support and advice that they need via ch a child helpline. But also, if necessary, child helplines will actively reach out to, ch to the to the children in all situations, for example, by providing information to schools or providing information online to make children more aware of the risks that they run online. Additionally, child helplines will, uh, if necessary, report an incident online to the proper authorities. And by nature, child helplines cooperate with partners in the child protection mechanism, such as police, uh, medical hospitals if needed, uh, other protection agencies of the government and NGOs to make sure that children are kept safe. And child helplines advocate with the proper authorities, such as governments and police, to make sure that children are made aware of the risks they run online and to make sure that policy and decision makers use the information that is gathered by the child helplines uh, for their decision and, uh, decisions and strategies. <clears throat> to sum up, uh, CHI works with child helplines, uh, as said earlier also, with uh, providing information, trainings and manuals, also on online awareness raising and online protection, the exchange of best practices and information. This means we facilitate peer, exchange, uh, peer uh, exchanges between the member helplines and uh, if necessary, for example, we can facilitate the sharing of uh, software or even hardware to sh make sure that uh, all child helplines all around the world are able to protect the children offline and online. Child helplines use a variety of means to reach out to children. Child helplines will always be will always try to be very contextual and sensible to the situation in, in each country. No one solution is viable in every situation. There needs to be a solution that works in that proper context. And together with the child helplines, we try to find the solution that is best. CHI with, works with the child helplines around the world to protect the, chi to protect the children online and offline. We try to use all the information that is there in the network and externally to make sure that child helplines know what they do and that they can provide the best proper care to the children that need it. And to a very important, oh sorry. On that online offline distinction, I may have missed it when you put up the chart, but of the 10 million calls, what fraction were related to online versus offline calls? Um, and uh, the, the 10 million are actually calls. That's right. Last year we had, adi in addition to that, we had about, uh, if I remember collect correctly, we had about 2 million um, offline contacts, meaning face-to-face -face and outreach, and we had about a million, no, sorry, uh, 600,000 at this moment, which has gone up rapidly in the last few years, uh, 600,000 actual contacts online. And those are contacts between your group and, and children. children. Yes, so, so let me ask the question a little differently. Of the, of the 10 million complaints or calls or information requests, what fraction of them had to do with the child experience and online problem versus an offline? Well, that is um, in our data collection. Um, let me show you the table here. Uh, it is quite hard for us at this moment to dis make a distinction between, between that. Our data collection is quite extensive, um, 
it does take a lot of time for our members to fill in and at this point uh, we do not make an actual distinction between online uh, cases of abuse and violence and offline abuse uh, we will try it is a discussion going on whether we should do that in the future because uh, at the same time it is an issue that is not like separate it is something very ser serious it is real so we should also take it into account into the context that are here but um, at this moment we don't have the cap capability yet to make that clear distinction we ask our members to fill in the numbers that they have for all abuse and violence cases and at this point in time we do not have like separate for each uh, for each means of contact yet if, you, can, were to, if you were to analyze the actual reports that were filed by these children it might be apparent whether they were being subject to risks in an online versus an offline. Yes, that is true, that is true. And we would welcome, um, in, in order for best practices, we would really welcome information from CHI on where the threats are coming from. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, that is something we are really working on, especially probably in the European region, but also together with, uh, for example, InSafe, the InSafe network. Um, and we really try to, to make that distinction. But, um, uh, our membership, as said, is very diverse. We have memberships all around the world in developing and developing nations uh, and uh, with several stadia of phases of development themselves, uh, startup, expansion and established, which means that to have one worldwide uh, means of data collection um, to have it standardized like this, uh, some cuts have to be made at some point and uh, over the years this has been developed like this. Um, uh, sorry, there are like three questions. I know. <laughs> I don't know who is like most... Uh, well, I would like to know, do you have any sort of standard procedures? So if, for example, it's peer relationships, do you give out guidelines to the helplines in your network to tell them how you should treat cyberbullying, what steps you could go, th go through? Uh, as said, um, we are at this moment having an online counseling training. Uh, that is especially for those helplines that have just started online counseling or are about to start online counseling and are not or do not feel capable to do that work yet or do not feel that they, in their experience, have felt gaps because online counseling is different than uh, phone counseling or face-to-face -face counseling and so we are very working actively to raise the awareness in the network uh, of in the ch in the network of child helplines on the issue of online counseling and we hope to make it so that we train the trainers so that the people that who are trained right now can spread the information within the network on the other side are already we are as an organization five years old several of our members while well, some of our members are 20, 30, even 40 years old. Um, and they are very well established, many times part of a larger organization of child protection. And honestly, they don't need our training. They can do that them, them themselves, so we don't won't tell them how to do it. Um, and again, we hear it, has, it is very important that, to know that the membership of CHI is very Diverse. For example, this the uh, example I gave of Sawa One to One in the Palestine areas is very different from the situation in Youth Line in New Zealand. Uh, Youth Line New Zealand has a very uh, established or is developing a very good, strong program of online counselling using also text messages to connect to children in their country. On the other hand, in the Palestine areas, it what can be done is very hard and um, so providing training and counseling to uh, to all members at the same time is is a situation which is hard but we try to have at least standards on the level of counseling that is out that is out there so that all child helplines have proper quality quality management that is also how we use the PSP checklist every year members are obliged to fill out a checklist and if gaps are shown in the network on particular issues that are there, we use that to provide trainings and manuals and guidelines to the membership on these issues that have been shown from the membership to be lacking. 
Uh, Joan, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, I know, I know, I know. This is really interesting discussions and I mean interaction, but obviously we had to, you know, give space sorry. also to other to other speakers I mean, and to, uh, yeah, yeah, to other issues, you know. So what I would suggest is to, I um, mean, have the questions at the end so we can maybe yeah. finish with you and then we can address. But I, oh, yeah. sorry, I do not have a question. I have an information okay. that could be valuable. Please. Okay, I'm representing the Swedish Awareness Node and we uh, cooperate with a helpline in Sweden, Children's Right in Society. And we have started doing the kind of information the gentleman is asking about to separate uh, the details of all the calls and the emails coming from children and to clarify what is internet or online related. And the last report is available in English in our, on our website www.medieradet.se And what it shows is that the most common problems even online, are friends, relations to friends, to families, and also bullying. There are very, very few reports of really severe uh, things like grooming. And another which is quite strange is that children are also very worried about uh, the internet use of their parents. Going to pornographic sites, uh, going to dating sites, going away for the weekend with someone they have just met on the internet and so on. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Uh, to make close up shortly, um, online is real life. Children experience that as not something different. It is just an extension of what they experience every day. Uh, as a final thing, I'd like to show you the second part of the case study. Um, this is how the child helpline uh, in case handled it and luckily they were able to resolve the case properly. Thank you. <laughs> Which is the senior director of the technology policy strategies from Microsoft. Microsoft. Uh, it's actually quite an honor to be the only uh, private company invited to speak here. Uh, I have to follow that by an apology, which I was taught never to do at the beginning of a speech. Um, I am not <coughs> Julian Mingrand. Um, I'm Jim Miller. Uh, Ju Julie, unfortunately, uh, as a result of uh, the happenings on the Thursday, had to change her, uh, uh, her plans. So there are three uh, good contacts at Microsoft on this. Uh, Julie is the second best person in the company. The very best was Chuck Costin who had wanted to be here, but he had a long-standing conflict with the date and wasn't able to make it. Julie has been extremely active in the area for a number of years. Julie and I <coughs> go back, it turns out, 12 years. I've been in the area for 12 years. I used to work at the World Wide Web Consortium, and I started the child protection work there almost, uh, well, 12 years ago now. Um, <coughs> so since I happen to be in Europe on the way to here, uh, I decided halfway might as well continue on. And in fact, more worried about the traffic in Hyderabad than the terrorist issues. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I'm going to deliver Julie's talk. And I'm happy to take questions, but understand that I'm not really the best person to answer. Julie also had prepared to bring here to hand you a very nice brochure, which all I can give you is a printed copy <laughs> of. Um, on a number of things that Microsoft is doing, but these are, these are publicly available and we'll get them circulated somehow. Um, Microsoft believes that the very best way that we can work on this problem is in partnership with many other organizations. And this is just a small sampling, and this is just the sampling from the Australian perspective. So we do the work, Chuck owns all of our work internationally, Julie owns the work in Australia, which is one of the areas where we've been most active. And then in each country and each region, we have other people who are tasked to work on this. And we have different partners. So I want to give you a brief history of why we care about this stuff. Um, Bill Gates really announced the vision that we have in, the, in 2000, um, basically saying, amongst other things, that the issue of protecting children on the internet 
has served as an excellent example of how governments and the private sector work together to tackle problems on the Internet. We really sincerely believe that. It's one of the reasons I left the Web Consortium and came to Microsoft, because I think that partnership is extremely good and extremely long. Uh, Bill's vision was broader than just the child protection area. His vision was that we need trustworthy computing. We need the general infrastructure of the Internet to be fully trusted as one trusts the telephone system. And he enumerated four pillars of that. Security, and that's security against attacks, protecting confidentiality, that's also partly where the child protection lives, but also privacy. So the second pillar in our trustworthy computing initiative, which has been now in its, its eighth year, um, is protecting privacy. A third, less relevant to this conversation, is reliability. And the, the fourth, which is an issue for the businesses here, is that we need to be very transparent about how we operate, what our practices are, and so forth. So what do we do in general about security and safety? We really pursue a, a three-part approach. And the first is that we do partnerships and we work at the policy level. So we don't just work on the technology. We work with the policy makers. We, um, my, my particular organization within Microsoft is specifically tasked with helping policy organizations understand technology, understanding where it's going, understanding the policy issues it raises, and asking what changes would you need to this technology to feel comfortable with it. So we're the interface between Microsoft's engineering organizations which build the technology and the policy community. The second is we do innovation in the technology. Twelve years ago, when I was at the Web Consortium, we were very concerned about the child protection issues. Those of you who remember that era, the U.S. Congress had passed a law which was a, a funny attempt to, uh, to regulate the space and the, uh, the, re the reaction of most of the companies involved and most of the groups, most of the citizen groups involved was that it had gone overboard towards a very uh, uh, conservative approach to doing that and we wanted an approach that allowed different governments and different parents to set up the, the regime for their children. We specifically were not looking at the illegal activities. We were looking at merely disturbing material online. Um, and at that time, we tried very hard to find partners in industry to work with us. Microsoft was the first one to step forward at Explorer. Since then, those have become standard in every browser. But it was the first one. And we continue to, to take that approach in our technologies. And then the third is we provide prescriptive guidance. That's partly what this brochure is, but mostly we do that through other organizations. We help them get their message out, we help them refine their message, and we help them deliver their message. So here are some of the kinds of things. This is not a, uh, a particularly easy to read slide, but this shows, for example, the Windows Live services, how you set the family safety settings. Now again, this is directed at the, uh, not at the cyber crime area, but rather at the child protection of dis making distinction between age groups, what's age appropriate for one, you know, for one child may not be appropriate for another child. And as you can see, this, uh, for example, the American Academy of Pediatrics has in fact established the guidelines and we're using those as a way to guide parents. So this is part of the prescriptive guidance to parents. It does not come from Microsoft. It comes from the American Association of Academy of Pediatrics. And then we are helping them deliver their message and build it into the technology so it's easy to use. We also produce a good deal of consumer education material and they are all, a lot of it is around these issues around how do you protect children. So it's, it's free content. We update it regularly and monthly usually. We do it and we provide syndication facilities for governments and NGOs so that they can provide input and that they can redistribute it. We're currently doing it in 24 languages. We're doing it in 35 countries. 
We have a whole variety of things available. We have tutorials, we have quizzes, we have contracts, we have downloads of software, we have blogs where we provide information, and it's in a variety of different kinds, different places. And this is the uh, one, one of the brochures we produce in its online form. We also have an, a printed form of this. We also work with law enforcement as part of their training activities. We help them understand how this technology works. We help them understand what technology is available for parents to use and for law enforcement to use. And we help them in figuring out what tools they need to better perform their job and partnering with them to get those tools created. We've also recently announced a major activity which is the uh, child exploitation tracking system which started out by a request from, uh, from a particular policeman, Detective Sergeant Paul Gillespie in the Toronto Police. He sent an um, email to Bill Gates and Bill's response was to say, you know, this is an excellent idea, let's engage, let's do something. So we provided, uh, it's basically intelligence analysis tools for analyzing data that law enforcement is already collecting to help them track back the origins of crime. It's deployed in eight countries, it's used by 172 different law enforcement agencies, 